Next talk this afternoon is a contribution from the University of Louisville, uh, from the Department of Chemistry uh, and the Center for Chemical Catalysis. Uh, the speaker will be myself. <laughs> My co-authors are Brad Slid, Jay Mehta, Jimmy Franco, Jan Ding, uh, John Richardson, and Mark Mashuda. And I will be talking about carbon dioxide bridged bimetallic complexes. We began the work in this area uh, about six years ago with the synthesis of some carbon dioxide bridged tin compounds. Uh, which we were preparing at the time for strictly the purposes of <coughs> characterizing uh, some metalloperoxylate anion complexes which we had made. Uh, not realizing that we uh, had entered into uh, what is, as a matter of fact, one of the holy grails in organometallic chemistry, that of trying to activate carbon dioxide. Uh, this is a formidable task, and I'm certainly not going to tell you this afternoon that we have accomplished that task, but I think we found some interesting chemistry uh, along the way, and I would like to tell you uh, about some of that. One of the things that is necessary, we think, uh, in activating carbon dioxide is certainly uh, to bind it to a uh, metal center in order to alter uh, its normally inert behavior. So our goals in this chemistry are, first of all, to establish general synthetic routes to CO2-bridged uh, compounds that may provide models for uh, catalytic intermediates. That is one of the things that uh, organometallic chemistry uh, can do as a contribution to catalysis is to synthesize model compounds which can be characterized because they're usually soluble complexes and then provide models for compounds that may be uh, catalytic intermediates. So our goals are to characterize the new uh, compounds, this is very pale but we'll try, characterize the new compounds through x-ray crystallography and through spectral methods and to define the bonding modes of the coordinated carbon dioxide. Then to probe the reactions of the bimetallic complexes, their study their thermolysis behavior, their reactions with electrophiles, and their reactions uh, with nucleophiles. And then finally, to define structure reactivity relationships. Shown on the slide here are some examples of uh, some early carbon dioxide complexes uh, which were characterized uh, by other people. And to begin to introduce the nomenclature system for the CO2 complexes which defines the uh, number of bonds there are to uh, the atoms in CO2 and between those atoms and uh, metal centers. And so the compounds that were prepared by Herskovitz are shown at the top. There was both an rhodium and, and iridium uh, complex, and these are defined as eta-1 complexes because they are bound through carbon of the carbon dioxide uh, only, not through any of the oxygen uh, centers. The tris cyclopentadienyl uh, phosphine, and there are two of these ligands, bound to nickel uh, allows the coordination of a carbon dioxide in what has sometimes been called eta-2 fashion, uh, both the central carbon uh, atom and one oxygen of the CO2 are coordinated to nickel in this case. There are other uh, examples of uh, this type of coordination. Uh, Lappert uh, later prepared a niobium complex which shows the same type uh, of bonding. Uh, the rhodium uh, complex, the nickel complex here, and the niobium complex were structurally uh, characterized uh, as well. 
And you begin to see what will be a recurring theme of steel two complexes as I continue to talk. And that is that the carbon dioxide is now no longer linear, but is bent, and the angle, OCO angle, varies uh, very much uh, from one type of complex to another. Typically, in the two types uh, that are shown here, the OCO bond angle is about 130 degrees. Illustrated on the slide here is the uh, structural uh, of the cobalt saline complex that was prepared by Floriani uh, a number of years ago. Uh, the sodium uh, derivative or analog of this uh, was also prepared. And this is the only example of an instance in which an alkali metal uh, center uh, is coordinated to CO2 in which that compound has been structurally characterized. And this is quite an unusual structure because the carboxylate uh, ligand here is bound uh, through carbon to the cobalt uh, center, but the oxygens are bound in a very unusual way. One of uh, the oxygens, and is this one, is bound to two potassium centers, while the other uh, carboxyl oxygen is bound only uh, to one. This is, so far, a unique structural type among the carbon dioxide complexes. This slide illustrates the structural types of carbon dioxide complexes which are known uh, to the present time. Uh, the 81 and 82 complexes were described uh, very early on. Uh, the ones that we have been involved with are described as mu2 eta2, mu2 eta3, and there are two classes of these. So these carbon dioxide bridged bimetallic complexes are the ones which have been of interest to us. Uh, let's talk about the nomenclature for just a moment. Uh, the mu corresponds to the, an indication of the number of metal centers that there are uh, that the CO2 uh, is bridging. Uh, eta and the number that is associated with it indicate the number of bonds involving the carbon dioxide ligand and the metal centers uh, that are involved. So this one is ester-like in terms of its formulation. And the one oxygen and the carboxyl carbon are the atoms that are coordinated to the two metal centers. Uh, with these two classes of compounds, the carbon center is again bound to one metal center and the two oxygens are bound, in this case, symmetrically to the second metal center. Whereas in the other case, the carboxyl carbon is bound to metal and the two oxygens are coordinated in an unsymmetrical way as you will see from the structural data in a little while uh, to the other metal center. Uh, we have prepared over the last five or six years uh, about 25 of these three types. Uh, structurally characterized to the present point in time about 15 uh, of them. The ones that are in uh, class two uh, here are all 10 compounds, and the ones that are in this class have uh, a transition metal, uh, either an early or late transition metal, uh, bound to the carboxyl oxygens. Uh, apart from these structural types, the number of carbon dioxide complexes of these other types that are illustrated here are very, very few in number. Uh, very little work uh, has been done beyond synthesizing uh, a compound of each of these four types uh, and structurally characterizing uh, the compound. Very little is known about the reaction chemistry of those systems. Synthesis of the metallocarboxylates uh, is usually the preliminary condition for synthesizing the carbon dioxide bridged compounds. And one can approach this in either of two ways. 
You can take an electron rich, rich metal center such as a metal anion and carbonate it as an organic chemist would carbonate a Grignard uh, reagent and create the carboxylate anion. Or you can take the opposite tack, which we usually have because the syntheses are generally cleaner. Take a metal carbonyl cation and add hydroxide ion to that to generate a metallocarboxylic acid, an intermediate, uh, incidentally, uh, the type that is frequently postulated in water gas shift chemistry. Uh, deprotonation of the metallocarboxylic acid uh, will lead to uh, the carboxylate anion. The systems that we uh, have examined uh, most are those that have uh, cyclopentadienyl or pentamethyl cyclopentadienyl uh, ligands attached to either iron, rhenium, or ruthenium together with some other uh, ancillary uh, ligands. And generation from this, these types of uh, carbonyl cations uh, via reaction of two uh, equivalents of potassium hydroxide will lead to the uh, potassium salts of the carboxylate uh, anions. Unfortunately, these are not crystalline uh, materials and we have not been able to structurally characterize uh, any of those. So the Floriani uh, compound remains the only one of those to be structurally characterized. Uh, in a few instances, the metallocarboxylic acids themselves are sufficiently nucleophilic through the carbon monoxide oxygen to behave as nucleophiles towards some of the reagents that are needed to generate the CO2 bridged compounds. Synthetic strategy uh, is really uh, straightforward. The carboxylate uh, anions are nucleophilic uh, toward the metal centers which have uh, weakly bound uh, ligand, either uh, halide or uh, in the later stages uh, an F uh, BF3 ligand. So this presents a summary of the types uh, of systems uh, that we have made uh, in this way. A variety of the 10 compounds having different kinds of alkyl groups or phenyl bound to the 10. These generate uh, either of two structural types of uh, carbon dioxide bridged uh, compounds, as I will explain uh, in a moment. In the case of the cyclopentadienyl rhenium uh, metallocarboxylic acid, it will react directly without conversion to the carboxylate anion. Sodium carbonate is not a sufficiently strong base to deprotonate the weakly acidic metallocarboxylic acid. The acid uh, will in fact react uh, with the tin reagent in the absence of the sodium carbonate to generate the CO2 bridge uh, compound. Uh, it's simply a cleaner reaction uh, if the HCl is scavenged by uh, sodium carbonate. Same kind of strategy is used uh, with the late transition metal CO2 bridged uh, complexes. Uh, and here a uh, BF3. Uh, FBF3 ligand is uh, weakly coordinated to the rhenium center. Uh, this is a type of synthesis that was, and a type of compound that was developed by Wolfgang Beck. Uh, we're simply making synthetic use of it uh, in this manner. The carboxylate anions, again, weakly nucleophilic, but sufficiently nucleophilic to displace from the coordination sphere of the rhenium center uh, the BF4 ligand and generate the carboxyl bridge. And the acid uh, is capable of generating uh, the CO2 bridge here uh, with uh, simply assistance from uh, sodium carbonate. Late transition metal, early tr uh, transition metal complexes uh, have been obtained uh, via reactions, a variety of reactions, some, uh, some of them involving the carboxylic acids uh, together with reagents such as the zirconosine uh, hydrochloride to generate the CO2 bridged late early uh, compounds.
the carbon dioxide uh, bridged tin compounds, there are two different modes of coordination as there are with the transition metal, transition metal systems also. And the mu 2 eta 2 variety uh, is shown here where O2 is not coordinated to the tin uh, atom. And these are easily distinguished by the structural data because the oxygen tin bond distances are very unequal. And there are characteristic bands in the infrared uh, spectrum which are associated with this type of carbon dioxide uh, bridge compound also. Uh, throughout the discussion of the spectral and structure correlations uh, here this afternoon, the infrared spectral data are obtained by the DRIFTS technique. So we're comparing solid state structures with solid state uh, infrared spectral data. And of course, in all cases, the higher frequency band is the asymmetric stretching frequency of carbon dioxide and the lower one uh, is the symmetric stretching frequency. So in the case of the alt alkyl tin complex, the preferred structure is the mu2 eta2. Uh, but the tin uh, has electron donating ligands associated uh, with it. And in that case, the tin atom is not particularly electrophilic. When the tin group has phenyl ligands associated with it, then the tin is more electrophilic and the second oxygen binds to uh, the uh, tin atom. Again, there is an unsymmetrical nature as far as the bonding is concerned, but now the second uh, oxygen is clearly bound to uh, the tin atom, whereas in the case above, there's nearly a tenths of an oxygen of difference uh, in the OSN bond links between the two. The characteristic infrared spectral data of the two types of complexes uh, are different as well. But notice that the lower frequency band does not change very much while the asymmetric stretching uh, vibration changes uh, very much. The same two types of structures are illustrated for the late, late uh, CO2 bridged uh, compounds. And this is a unit that we have used uh, a great deal uh, in our CO2 bridged uh, work. It has a uh, cyclopentadienyl ligand bound to uh, iron, and the cyclopentadienyl ligand uh, essentially takes the three facial positions of an octahedron on uh, a six coordinate uh, iron and then the uh, phosphine uh, ligand, the uh, carbon monoxide and the carboxyl uh, group take the other three facial positions of the octahedral iron center. So again, one of the carboxyl uh, oxygens is bound to the second metal center uh, and the other uh, is not. And in those cases, the uh, carboxyl stretching frequencies uh, are as shown here. The one around 1500 is typical for the mu2 eta2 uh, type of structure. What is illustrated below is a uh, structurally related because they come from the same uh, carboxylate uh, center, uh, rhenium complex, uh, which now uh, is of the mu2 eta3 type. And it is possible uh, with uh, the, the mutuated two types to generate the, the type shown below by a simple thermolysis reaction in which the free oxygen comes over to the rhenium center and bumps out a carbon monoxide ligand and then assumes its position in the coordination sphere of the rhenium. And that's typically how these compounds have been prepared. Uh, it's just that in the case of the system which has a phosphine ligand bound to rhenium, uh, we were unable to get uh, crystallographic quality crystals uh, out of the system in order to be able to characterize it, where in the case of the phosphite system, uh, we can do so. Uh, notice also differences in the carboxyl stretching frequencies uh, of these two classes of compounds. Now, 
both bands are uh, distinctly different. Alan Cutler uh, is one of the individuals who works with carbon dioxide complexes also. He had made a number of years ago uh, some rhenium zirconium complexes, not these, but some that are related to them, but had not been able to structurally characterize any of the compounds. Uh, he did report uh, infrared spectral data, and we thought that the spectral characteristics of the compounds were strange as compared to ours because you'll notice the asymmetric stretching frequency of the CO2 ligand is a very much lower frequency than is true for uh, the late, late CO2 bridge compounds uh, which we uh, had reported. Uh, whereas the symmetric stretching frequency uh, in these two compounds uh, is in about the same place as those of the late transition metal compounds which we had characterized. The geometry about the carboxyl side, so to speak, the carbon bound metal center is very much like the iron uh, systems I showed a moment ago. It's a face capped octahedron. The zirconium geometry is usually described in these complexes as an edge capped tetrahedral. Uh, environment where we're really talking about the uh, median to the cyclopentadienyl ring uh, in each case here uh, to the zirconium atom. The oxygens and the chlorine of this compound all lie essentially in a plane, so uh, the chlorine can be regarded as a capping ligand in a tetrahedral uh, environment. The rhenium complex and the ruthenium complex are very closely uh, related structurally. And they are very highly symmetrical systems, as are their late, late analogs. The O's, the R bonds uh, here are nearly equivalent as they are uh, here. And that is a characteristic of the transition metal compounds as compared to uh, the 10 uh, derivatives. Although we were able to structurally characterize the zirconium complexes, we still didn't understand why the carboxyl stretching frequencies in those compounds uh, were different, particularly with regard to the asymmetric stretching frequency from the ones that we had prepared. So on this slide I have two compounds which have the same carboxyl side, so to speak but have different metal centers binding the carboxyl oxygens uh, in the two cases. Notice again with these uh, transition metal complexes that the O metal bonds are nearly equivalent in the two complexes. But note the difference in the asymmetric stretching frequency of the carboxyl carbon in this one as compared to the other one. There are more than 100 wave numbers difference between the two while the symmetric stretching band is nearly the same. Finally, we figured it out. It's the coordination geometry at the second metal center which is, co which is controlling the asymmetric stretching frequency. Because the geometry around the molybdenum center here is that of a square-based pyramid with the two oxygens of the carboxyl group and the two carbonyl ligands uh, essentially in a plane and the cyclopentadienyl uh, group uh, being in an apical position relative to those. But the variation of the asymmetric stretching frequency is with uh, the geometry at the second metal center. This slide is simply a summary of the compounds uh, which have this rhenium carboxylate uh, system as part of its structure and the M prime is then varied uh, from one metal center uh, to another. So the systems which are octahedral rhenium groups coordinated to uh, the carboxyl oxygens 
have essentially the same infrared spectral characteristics. The zirconium system has the same symmetric stretching frequency, but a different asymmetric stretching frequency. And the molybdenum compound, which I just showed you, and its tungsten analog, which we have also prepared but not structurally characterized, we assume it has a similar structure. Infrared spectral characteristics of those two are nearly identical. The unsymmetrically uh, bonded uh, materials uh, of, that are associated with this uh, rhenium carboxylate uh, have a trigonal bipyramidal tin atom associated with them and asymmetric stretching frequencies which are similar uh, to the ones which have an octahedral rhenium atom binding the oxygens. But the symmetric stretching frequency now of those is different. So they are distinguishable from the transition metal compounds easily. This is uh, summary data of the uh, CO2 bridge compounds which have uh, this type of bonding, mu 2 a 2 and you'll see that the asymmetric stretching frequencies for them are, are all in a small uh, region relative to one another. Uh, the symmetric uh, stretching frequencies do differ uh, a bit, uh, although they're all below uh, 1200 wave numbers, and that is a characteristic of this type uh, of compound. <coughs> The systems which have CO2 bridged in the same way between two metal centers, but which have metal centers which are bound together, are different than they are metal cycles, and the carboxyl stretching frequencies uh, of these are distinctly different from uh, the ones above, which are uh, like uh, the acyclic organic esters, whereas these are like lactones, or the organometallic equivalent of lactones. So the asymmetric stretching frequency for these uh, tends to be very high and it is ring size dependent just as it is uh, with organic uh, compounds. The A to 2 type of CO2 complexes, which I showed very early on, uh, have very high uh, asymmetric stretching frequencies as you would expect uh, for this type of strained uh, system. It's appropriate to ask what relation those CO2 bridge compounds and the carbon dioxide compounds in general uh, have to surface bound carbon dioxide. So what I'm going to uh, define here are some alkali metal complexes of the carbon dioxide radical anion which were prepared a number of years ago and whose spectral properties were determined by Margrave and his co-workers. Uh, was calculated for the CO2 radical anion, which of course is bent and has an OCO angle of approximately 135 degrees. Our, the asymmetric stretching frequency at 1677, the symmetric one at 1404, and then the bending mode, which we are usually unable to see because there's so much activity uh, in that area as far as the infrared spectrum is concerned that we really can't uh, determine uh, or identify uh, the bending mode, but these are in our compounds usually clear as they are uh, in those made by other people uh, as well. And the CO2 bands of course differ depending upon the number of alkali metals that are coordinated to uh, the oxygen uh, and the symmetry class uh, that the compound uh, belongs to. So all three uh, bands, the two stretching vibrations and the bending vibrations can be identified for uh, this lithium uh, salt. And uh, there is another class which has C2B symmetry and its bands are uh, distinct. And then there are two classes of uh, compounds having different symmetry properties uh, which have two metal centers coordinated to the oxygens and the metal center in these two examples uh, is cesium. And clearly 
the CO2 bands vary according to the symmetry class and to whether there is one or two metal centers coordinated uh, to the system. There are a few examples of carbon dioxide radical anion bound to metal surfaces. And most of this is fairly recent work. It is vibrational data, but it is obtained from uh, H-real spectroscopy, uh, high-resolution electron energy loss uh, spectroscopy. And in those instances, it is usually difficult to uh, identify the asymmetric stretching frequency of uh, the CO2, but the symmetric stretching frequency and the bending mode uh, can usually be seen. And you will note that at least in the case of the symmetric band, that that is fairly close to what we are seeing in the carbon dioxide uh, bimetallic, bridge bimetallic uh, complexes. They are in the 11 to 1200 uh, wave number region, as we are seeing uh, for those as well. The asymmetric uh, stretching vibration is difficult to uh, identify because it is a relatively weaker band than the symmetric uh, stretching frequency, and that causes problems. We've begun to study a few of the reactions of the compounds, and certainly the reaction that we uh, studied most are various kinds of thermolysis reactions because we want to see uh, how well the metal centers bind to uh, the carbon dioxide. As I indicated earlier, the usual way of generating one of the mu 2 3 complexes is simply a simple thermolysis reaction, which allows the uh, unbound oxygen to come over to the second metal center and displace uh, coordinated ligand, uh, in this case, uh, carbon oxide. And if you do a low temperature solution thermolysis of this iron rhenium uh, complex, you do indeed uh, obtain the uh, mu 2 to 3 type of complex shown here, which we have structurally characterized. In fact, it's on one of the earlier slides. This is uh, what we call the anti-isomer because the two phosphorus ligands are relatively far from one another. The rhenium center has facial geometry with regard to the carbon, carbon monoxide ligands. And so we thought we were understanding this fairly well. Uh, we've done these kinds of thermolysis reactions under two different conditions. Sometimes we deal in solution, and those tend to be not very clean reactions. And then others uh, have been done in the solid state. And so we decided we would do that, and we took this and did thermolysis on it. And we obtained a compound that was totally unrelated to the one here. And actually what it is, uh, is the mu 2 to 3 complex shown down here, in which the two metal atoms have exchanged phosphorus ligands. Uh, this is certainly unusual uh, behavior of the metal centers. And we found that we could follow the course of the thermolysis reactions in solution over a long period of time by simply looking at the phosphorus spectra because the uh, chemical shifts of the phosphine and the phosphide are very different and they're uh, different uh, easily from uh, the compound which has a phosphide bound to iron instead of to rhenium. So it's an easy path to see. Uh, we also follow the reaction by infrared uh, spectroscopy uh, over a long period of time and found that the coordination uh, the carbon monoxide ligands to the rhenium center remain facial throughout. So what we think uh, is happening is, first of all, isomerization of uh, this center uh, to the syn isomer rather than the anti-isomer. It's not this one which gives rise to this final product. Uh, it will do so if carbon monoxide is present, but only if that's true. So the reaction takes, of course, we think, uh, where a syn isomer uh, is produced, and that uh, is where the ligand exchange occurs by a path that I'll show you in just a moment, and then that finally isomerizes to the anti-isomer. Uh, syn anti-isomerization of the type uh, shown here has been uh, demonstrated for both manganese and rhenium uh, complexes. A simple pictorial of how uh, this might occur uh, is shown with the syn isomer uh, breaking 
an old rhenium bond freeing a coordination site on the rhenium will provide a coordination vacancy for the phosphine to migrate to. And a twisting around of this system will allow the triethyl phosphide ligand on the rhenium to come over to the vacant site uh, on iron and then go to an intermediate uh, but coordinatedly unsaturated mu 282 system which then recombines to give uh, the sin isomer which finally leads to uh, the other product. We've done a few uh, reactions trying to explore uh, the vulnerability of the carbon dioxide bridging ligand uh, to electrophiles. <coughs> Uh, HBF4 uh, etherate uh, is one of the electrophiles that we've used. Methyl triflate uh, is another, and trimethyl silo triflate uh, is another. Uh, the reason for doing so many uh, is simply that the first two of these take the path that's shown above, uh, which is uh, cleavage of the bonds in such a way that it's not possible to tell whether or not the o rhenium bond or a carbon-oxygen bond has been broken by the electrophile because either of those could finally result in the products uh, that are shown here. But when trimethylsilotriflate uh, is used and one equivalent of it is used furthermore, it becomes clear that it is the carbon-oxygen bond of the CO2 bridge which is vulnerable to electrophilic cleavage because the trimethyl silo ether can be isolated and characterized. You've not heard me say anything to this point uh, in time about the addition of nucleophiles to the carbon dioxide bridge uh, compounds. Uh, and that is because there's not very much yet to say uh, about that, neither from our group or from those uh, from that or other uh, groups that are studying uh, these kinds of complexes. But the one of the reagents that we have looked at is this uh, hydrogenomethyl uh, zirconosine uh, derivative. And what we had hoped might happen was either of the things uh, shown here, and that is uh, either uh, addition of the zirconia, zirconium center, which is very oxophilic, to uh, an oxygen center of the CO2 bridge, uh, followed by opening of that and generation of a partially reduced carbon dioxide ligand, which we have now three different metals uh, attached to it. Further reaction with the hydrido uh, methyl zirconium might result in formation of a formaldehyde bridged uh, system. Uh, however, this is not the case. Uh, the system yields a complex which has this general molecular formula, and we believe uh, the structure uh, because that is con consistent with the uh, spectral data and elemental analysis data. We're not unable so far to crystallize this or its rhenium uh, analog, but the zirconium center is now what binds the carboxyl oxygens and the 10 group uh, has been displaced. We've done various probes of this reaction trying to figure out exactly uh, how this happens. And we find that there is no reaction between triphenylstanane and the uh, CO2 bridge system which is shown here, which we can prepare independently. Uh, the reaction of the uh, hydrido uh, system with this might uh, yield uh, the intermediate hydride species, which is shown here, and the hydrido zirconium uh, reagents are reasonably good reducing agents. So we think the path that is being followed uh, here is one in which this intermediate zirconium hydrido uh, complex reacts with methyl triphenyl 10 and the methane and the ultimate uh, tin product are what are shown uh, to be formed.
I think this would bring, be bringing things to a close here before my audience falls asleep uh, from either heavy lunch or uh, too many CO2 complexes. So let me <laughs> simply thank the United States Department of Energy, a division of Temple Sciences of the Office of Basic Energy Sciences uh, for support of our work for a long time. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education for a GAN fellowship to Brad Sled. Uh, support from the National Science Foundation and the Kentucky, Kentucky EBSCO uh, program, particularly for support of the Molecular Structure Laboratory at the University of Louisville. And not least, our long and very fruitful collaboration with John Richardson and Martin Mishuda uh, for the X-ray structural data. And thank you for your attention. try to answer a couple of questions before uh, you guys would like to get off to your coffee break if you wish. I've got a question about yes. your high frequency CO stretch. Sure. Um, I didn't understand, you said it, it moved around a lot. It, it moves around with the coordination geometry at the metal center that it binds the carboxyl oxygen. Right. Do, do you see that as being a steric or electronic? We have no idea what is uh, doing that. Uh, it would be most desirable to have a normal coordinate analysis uh, done on these complexes, but uh, none of the people that are doing this type of thing have so far gone beyond the compounds which have CO2 bound to a single metal center. Those are very difficult calculations, and doing it with the bimetallic systems would be even worse. And so we, we honestly have no idea at this time uh, what is doing that exactly nor what implications it may have with regard to the reactivity uh, of the compounds. Anyone else? Okay, how about a break?